Good? I'm trying. Right. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks to our virtual audience for watching us. We are streaming this event, so if anybody you know was not able to come or was drowned out by the rain, thank God it quit, um, <laughs> you can direct them towards our Facebook video page or YouTube. You don't have to belong to Facebook to watch our events on Facebook. So I know a lot of you are new to the store. I'm Barbara Peters. I'm the owner and general interlocutor. However, the rest of the staff also participate. Um, and we have a wonderful newsletter that will tell you about all the things we're doing. I just sent out one this morning. So there's a sign-up sheet on the counter. It's free and it's sort of fun. So before you leave, if you like, please sign up for it. Karen also has a wonderful newsletter. Are they all on your mailing list, do you think? You know what? I know a lot of you are. I recognize a lot of faces, um, but I will have a sign-up sheet um, at the end. So anybody who is not on my newsletter, it comes out every six weeks um, because, frankly, I, I don't like to, you know, pound away at people's inboxes and fill them. But uh, it always features some of my book news, but it also always features an essay and a book giveaway by another woman author. So if you like that kind of thing, you can sign up for the newsletter, and I promise I won't bug you more than once every six weeks. Mine's much more commercial. <laughs> but I try to limit it to once a week unless there's breaking news. And the other reason it's good to be on it is that in this uncertain world, sometimes we have, I mean, I'm current, I have actually already scheduled an event for June 24th. Um, and in this uncertain world, things go wrong. And the only way I can actually tell you that is through our e-news or some way to communicate with you and say, don't come, you know, because it's all changed. So it'd be really helpful for those of you who sign up. There are almost 20,000 people on it. So, um, you know, I try to write with that in mind. And a great many are international customers. And, of course, they don't care about coming here, but they watch the videos, which are really surprising. So oftentimes several thousand people actually watching it while we're doing this so that's fun and there's a podcast anyway while i'm doing commercial breaks lisa you want to stand up and talk about the the kidney lunch come on <laughs> the arizona women's sport well you might as well well or i can um all right so the arizona women's board which is um used to be called the irma bombeck book and author lunch and is designed to raise money to help um patients with kidney problems um, will be held on November 5th this year. The lunch is already sold out, but you do have an opportunity to participate in the raffle. Are you going to record? Are you recording any of it for people to watch? Taking, uh, interest, see how many people are interested. We need a certain number in order to make the investment to live stream it. So we haven't determined that yet. So we need people to register to do the live stream if that's what they want. You know, you're really lucky that you actually know somebody who live streams for free. <laughs> have you thought about that? I'm going to let them know about that. Yeah, yeah, I know it. I don't know if Larry will to take all the equipment out there. We could do that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, the prizes are spectacular. There's a, um, a trip to New York with Adriana Trigiani. Um, and there's, what, jewelry? and Jewelry with some, uh, dinner with Mark Tarbell. And dinner with Mark Tarbell. And you don't have to go to the lunch. You can, you know, because as I said, it's sold out and has a waiting list. But in fact, you can participate in that part of it. And that might encourage you to sign up for a table earlier next year, right? We also, just to be fair, in March, the first, I'm trying to remember what date it is, March 13th or something, we also do the book sales for the Brandeis Book and Author Lunch, which is a different crowd and has different authors. So I'm really pleased that we can participate in raising funds for book-related events here in Scottsdale. But today, it's Karen's book, and I'm happy to say this is her fourth book and her fourth appearance at the Poison Pen. It's been wonderful. Yeah. Right. I will also mention that Karen made scones, and we have backup in chocolate cake and cookies. So I said it was kind of a Victorian tea, and uh, here we are. So this is the second book, Under a Veiled Moon, by a character called Michael Coravan. But you, um, I'm not sure, do we have the earlier books? Are they still the other two from Harper? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We do. Yeah, I saw them. I so saw you them might want to mention yeah. them briefly before yeah. we talk about Michael. Yeah. So uh, I, I actually have um, five books. Uh, the first one was only ever released as an ebook and an audiobook. That was The Lady in the Smoke. The second one is A Dangerous Duet. And the third is A Trace of Deceit. And they're available in paperback. And I think you have a few copies up front. So we do. These are always 
but then you decided to go a different direction with a different character I did. last year. Yeah. So who was he? No, it was actually two years ago, wasn't it? Uh, no, last no, year. No, was it last, last year? year. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And it was called Down a Dark River. Yeah. Right. So tell us about yeah. that, and then we'll move on to this. So um, as, as a lot of you know, uh, the first three books uh, that I wrote all featured a young woman protagonist caught up in a mystery because someone she loves is injured or murdered. Um, they were all set in 1870s London. They had some interconnected secondary characters. And for each one of those, I took some aspect of Victorian culture as my starting point. The first one was railway disasters and sabotage. The second one was music halls and thieving rings. And the third one was the art and auction world. And for the fourth one, the inspiration actually came from a story that I read in a magazine, I don't know, maybe six years ago. And it was about a young woman who had been jaywalking across a quiet street and she was hit by a drunk driver. And when the family sued on her behalf because she was in the hospital for months, the judge very coldly and dismissively awarded her $2,000 because she was jaywalking ostensibly. And in the aftermath, <clears throat> excuse me, in the aftermath, her father threatened the judge's daughter. And this really struck me because it got me thinking about failures of empathy, about disavowal, how it creates a desire for revenge. Um, because I think what was really happening there was he wanted the judge to get it. He wanted the judge to know what it was like to almost lose a child. And so I wanted to put this story in Victorian England, but I don't know, I was maybe 10 minutes into thinking about this story and realizing I can't do this with a young woman amateur sleuth. I need a man, like I need a man. <laughs> and, um, and because all of the judges and the lawyers and the witnesses and everybody who was kind of beginning to populate my story were all men. And I, I needed to have an inspector at Scotland Yard. And I did have some research done because Matthew Hallam, who is an inspector at Scotland Yard is in book two and in book three. So I had done some background, but I wanted someone a little rougher around the edges. I wanted someone who was Irish and an outsider, and so that's how Michael Corvin came into being. Why, did you, why did you want an outsider? Well, he was already going to be an outsider um, at Scotland Yard because in one of the things I discovered in my research was that in 1877, there was a trial in which four of the senior inspectors at Scotland Yard um, were accused and convicted of taking bribes from con men, like thousands of pounds, and helping them escape London, too, um, putting them on boats to help them get across the river and get them out of town. And it was a huge scandal. It was held at the Old Bailey. The trial was held at the Old Bailey, which is kind of like Judge Judy on steroids for the Victorians. There were mobs. There were people yelling. There were newspaper headlines, all of this stuff. And so... After about October of 1877, for a long time, the Scotland Yard were sort of, they were sort of persona non grata. Nobody wanted to talk to them. Nobody trusted them with good reason. Um, these four people who were convicted were not young rookies. These were people between them, they had 80 years of experience on the job. So you kind of wondered what else they were getting up to the past two decades. And so they were, he would be an outsider as a Scotland Yard man anyway. But then I thought, what if I were to try and tackle him being an outsider in his personal life as well. Um, what is it like to be an Irishman in London? Because at that point, there was a lot of anti-Irish sentiment um, and a lot of terrible prejudice and some really vitriolic um, books and things written about it. So that's why I wanted to be yeah. Irish. So policing in England was still evolving. The first police force was, I'm trying to remember, 1830-something. And Sir Robert Peel actually moved from the Bow Street Runners, which were a very, if you read Jane Austen or Regency things, you'll know that people would hire Bow Street Runners. But they were often kind of um, not up for the job, not professional, dissolute. Um, and, and they were more like private eyes in some respects, although they did have a... Uh, a headquarters and a mm -hmm. supervisor. Mm -hmm. But anyway, the first police force, that's why British policemen are called Bobbies, after Sir Robert Peel. 
it's still there. But at this point um, today, Scotland Yard would not be handling this case. There would be the London Metropolitan Police. Mm -hmm. Scotland Yard, basically, is the FBI, and then there are for England. Uh, MI5 and MI6 are, are different. MI5 is, a, is internal security. MI6 is James Bond and M and, you know, outside security. And then cities have police forces, and Scotland Yard is kind of a general they can go anywhere. Right, but um, also, there are the river police. Mm -hmm. And so Michael Corvin, in this book, has, he's, not, he's still part of Scotland Yard, but he's actually functioning as a supervisor yeah. for the river police, which is a really cool thing. How many of you have read Ann Perry's William Monk series? Do any of you know that? Right. She wrote a wonderful set of books about a man named William Monk in the 1860s, mm -hmm. who, in fact, was a river policeman. Um, so their jurisdiction was really the Thames, and it was fairly international because there were all kinds of ships coming in because England was like a, you know, the hub of the British Empire. So they would often have to deal with cases where people were international citizens, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, but in this case, in the book that you're, in this book, you're really dealing with a domestic disaster yeah. because the two ships involved are, in fact, British. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Um, when I was about, I don't know, I think I was about halfway through my research in Down a Dark River. And I remember kind of coming across a mention of it. It was sort of, you know, one of like a, like a subordinate clause or something, you know, something like, uh, you know, after the fateful uh, maritime disaster of 1878, and then it went on to blah, blah, blah. And I was like, wait, what, what's the fateful maritime disaster of 1878? You know, and so I start Googling and I'm trying to find it and eventually it comes up. It's the Princess Alice disaster. And I, I think the thing that fascinated me about that, um, and really the, the, that was the whole reason that I brought Michael Corvin from Scotland Yard over to Wapping River Police, because I wanted him to work on this case. Right. Um, what was interesting is that the, the, the Princess Alice was a small wooden steamship, and it was one of like four or five. And for those of you who know London, um, you could do a day trip on the steamship. Um, you could hop on at London Bridge at Swan Pier right there, and for two shillings you could ride all the way out to the North Sea, and then you could come all the way back at night. Um, you could hop off for a picnic and hop back on the next one, or you know whatever you wanted to do. and. The night of September 3rd, um, they were coming up and around Tripcock Point, which is a blind curve. And then in the Bywell Castle, which is a 900-ton iron-hulled coal carrier, and it, comes, it came down. And a lot of people don't know, but the Thames is tidal, and it happened to be an ebb tide. So twice a day, you've got tides going you know, going back and forth and water levels rising and falling and all that kind of thing. Anyway, so it was coming down the river and it, it smashed into the Princess Alice. Didn't see it, couldn't stop in time. Um, broke the ship into three parts. It sank in four minutes and 650 people were in the water. But because it's like a, one of our hop-on, hop-off tour buses, there's no, patient, there's no passenger manifest. No one knows who's on the boat. And so this kind of I then then I started like reading around and finding out like all kinds of other interesting facts about it but I thought how interesting that nobody knows who's on the boat so what if there's somebody for example who wants to pretend he's on the boat so he can start a new life and I actually found a story about somebody who did that where he just where it turned out that he he faked his own death in the Princess Alice disaster and took off and started a new life with a new wife and everything so I thought that was kind of interesting <laughs> anyway but um <laughs> Well, so, actually, there was more than one person who did that at 9-11, you know, no, pretended that they no. were um, in the building and um, in the trade towers and um, wasn't always possible to, wasn't possible to determine they whether they sure. had been or not. Yeah. So it's not the first time that people have taken advantage mm -hmm. of some kind of disaster, but you're right, mm -hmm. that um, with no passenger manifest, right. too many people on the ship. Mm -hmm. Here's the really bad news for women. Remember how Victorians dressed? What if you were in the river? Oh, those crinolines were so... You were going to go down. I mean, there was yeah. no way that mm -hmm. you were going to be able to survive all that clothing. Just the way Victorian women burned up like candles, you know, because they would get too close to the fire and that stuff would, you know, those crinolines and all would catch fire and there was no way to get out of them mm -hmm. in time. Mm -hmm. It was really hazardous it to was. have that, you know, that yards and yards yeah. of completely not flame-proof fabric all over yeah. you. Well, then they had the, well, then they had the hoops. 
Um, but one of the one of the problems with that was you couldn't get on and off of trains easily because I don't know if you remember the, yeah. the the trains had the narrow passageways that you would like you like if you think about the Harry Potter movies they, like they have the narrow narrow passageway and then you go in and you can't you can't maneuver those things so sometimes what would happen is they would literally have to like pick up their skirts like in very indecorous ways and have like their maids stand next to them so that nobody could see anything in the whole the whole Hope they were together. wearing clean right. underwear <laughs> <laughs> right yeah. oh dear yeah. yep yep um, but I, I was really interested in reading this to recognize how many people did take these little day trip, you know, excursions, and they would get on in the morning and maybe not get back till like one in the morning. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was a long day, and they would take their children and all. But I didn't. I I've been down the Thames all the way to you know to the North Sea and all. I don't think of it as vacation land. <laughs> I just don't. But I find it fascinating mm -hmm. that this was such a big. Victorian outing. Well, they had, so there were four different stops. Um, there was one place where people got off uh, and there were like, there was like archery and a promenade that you could do. And then there was another one where there was like a, a established picnic area. And I'm trying to remember, oh, there was a maze like that love that apparently was like the site that, where people went to uh, get lost with with their <laughs> lovers or whatever they were doing and it was, it was very scandalous um there was a yeah there's a sort of a maze and like a labyrinth kind of thing and there was something else i'm trying to remember i think it was concert hall so there was right. a, so they would have music so you could you know if you wanted to pop off and do one or more you could you know you could just kind of keep doing them and there was and then you know some other boat would come swing by and Pick you up. But it wasn't a trip to the beach. No. And the other thing to remember is the Thames was unbelievably polluted. Mm -hmm. So even if you, you know, survived all the other problems, you could easily die of whatever. Well, people didn't swim for a good reason. Yeah. Um, but if you inhaled the water, yes. you know, that could kill you just that, as easily. And that was one of the problems because, um, so back in mm, 1860s, 1850s, the Great Stink, yeah. 1854, I think, um, that was when um, the Thames was still being used as a sewer. And it got so bad that the people in Parliament, in, in they, they put up these huge sheets sprayed with lime to try to block the smell, and they were all holding their scented handkerchiefs to their faces, that whole thing. Um, well, Basil get eventually yeah I mean they hired him and said okay you got you got to get this out of London and so he built these enormous um, pipes to pump it all downstream um, I think it was about six or seven no maybe like 10 miles downstream well Tripcock Point happened to be unfortunately right across from this processing plant and they had just dumped that night so it's not only I mean hate to do the whole like it's really gross but but that's one of the other reasons that so many people drowned. It was it was very mucky. It was very nasty um, that that night in particular. So yeah, not a nice accident. Not a nice accident. Now, in in real life, it was it was an accident. Mm -hmm. But Karen's writing a murder mystery. So was it an accident that the coal barge rammed into the princess house? Mm. A question to be answered, right? Yes, yes, of course. As they say. Well, when I find when I found out these 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 two pieces of information, and it's funny because I was talking to another a historical mystery writer, and she said, you know, oftentimes you find some great little nugget of information you come across, you know, like like the Princess Alice disaster, and it's got all kinds ripe with possibility, and then you find some other little nugget, and there's something about putting the two of them together that makes a certain energy. Um, yeah. Have you, you do, do you, would you agree that's true? Mm -hmm. Like taking two things. And the other piece that I found was this anti Irish sentiment and the rise of the Irish Republican Brotherhood. Um, in 1800, uh, Ireland, Ireland dissolved their parliament and all their members of parliament went to London. Um, now, obviously, they were always going to be a minority. And so, you know, when things happened like the, um, like the potato famine, um, oftentimes they had a really hard time pushing through legislation that would assist the Irish people. So there was a real push after that for Ireland to take home rule back, not to run the empire from Dublin, but to at least get enough power to take care of the Irish people. Um, in Parliament. Um, and, and they kept trying to get this, but of course, um, the English Parliament was kind of like, you know, <laughs> why? 
<laughs> Why would we give you back your, you know, power that we, we want? I mean, we want to have a certain amount of control over, over what's happening in Ireland. And so there was a group called the Irish Republican Brotherhood. Um, they're, they're known as by the Fenians here in the U.S. Um, who were uh, determined to use violence to get some attention for their cause and to pressure Parliament into letting Ireland get home rule back. So um, I was really interested, though, in this Irish Republican Brotherhood and um, how it, I didn't realize by the 1870s it had cells in every major city all over England. And they were getting dynamite and arms and money from America, um, partly because there were a lot of Irish soldiers during the Civil War who became really adept with firearms and bombs. So they could they could ex basically export their knowledge and the dynamite, which was illegal in the UK, um, over to over to Ireland. So I, I took these two pieces together and I thought, hmm, let me get them close together and see what happens. So that was how that was really the impetus for this book. It's pretty boring to write a mystery that only has a one track story. Mm. So you really do have to come up with other stuff. How many of you know when Ireland actually became under British rule? The answer might surprise a lot of you. Anybody know? When did Ireland fall under British rule? I mean, you tend to think of, you know, Scotland, the, the Union was in the 17, what was it, 14 or 12 or something mm -hmm. under Queen Anne. Mm -hmm. It was under Queen Elizabeth. The British went over and conquered Ireland, so to speak, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, created, created some aristocracy. There, there were Irish lords that, you know, had titles, but their estates mm -hmm. were in Ireland. Um, and I think it was, I'm trying to remember which of Queen Elizabeth's young men, um, was Roberto Devereux, it was Robert Devereux, Devereux. yeah, mm -hmm. in 1895, I mean, sorry, 1595, um, was, was part of that whole thing. So Ireland had been under what they called the English boot heel mm -hmm. for a really long time. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, there was a, a big movement towards the, and you talk about it in your book. One of the, the real life tragedy was that they almost got to, in what was it, 1880-something, mm -hmm. some hope of giving Ireland home rule. And the leading Irish politician got involved in a terrible marital scandal. Does this sound like today? I'm telling you. <laughs> um, and, you know, no, and it just, I'm trying, like what thing. was his name? Wasn't O'Connell? I'm trying to think of his uh, name. Charles P starts with a P, Parnell. Parnell. Yep. And, you know, his personal life, in fact, blew the whole thing up, which led to the much more active um, activity in the early 20th century after, after the First World War. Yeah. You know, involved. but if it hadn't been for Parnell's sex life, Mm -hmm. um, the whole thing might have. Isn't it amazing how politics can turn on the personalities of <laughs> politicians? Which I hope we're not seeing here in Arizona at the moment, but there we go. Um, anyway, <laughs> uh, well, sorry. <laughs> just, uh, really, the New York Times wrote a really embarrassing article today about you know the whole thing. It's kind of hard to sit there and watch that. But anyway, you're before that, right? Because yeah. we're in the 1870s. 1878, yeah. And so you're, you're working towards some politicians in England sympathetic to home rule. Mm -hmm. And this disaster may, in fact, blow all that up yeah. before we get to Parnell. Yep. Yes interesting yeah well and I like I like I like the idea that you know you have certain small groups of people who are trying to make it work mm -hmm. you know they're trying to they're like okay you we're, we're gonna we're gonna get these people together we're gonna get these people together some reasonable people in a room talking and it can actually help it can actually make something happen and I wanted to talk about that and how you know how small groups of people who um, you know, are, are open to reaching across the aisle, I guess, as it were, um, can actually make a difference. Yeah. Great. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, what was I, oh, tell us about Michael Furvin, because he's really an interesting character. Um, Whitechapel, where he grew up, you might want to sort of fill us in on all that. Yeah, so he is a former thief and <laughs> bare knuckles boxer from Whitechapel, which probably most of you know as the Jack the Ripper territory, um, the following decade. So he was doing his evil deeds in what, 1888, somewhere in there? That was, I think it was the 1890s by then or something. Oh, was it? Okay. Maybe. 
right so, right um, I'll look it up. It's not a. It's not. It, it's not a nice section that he's growing up. And he's born mm -hmm. in Ireland. His parents came over from Ireland um, to Liverpool, which was kind of like usually the first entry point, and then down to London eventually when they couldn't find work there. And his father dies when he's three. His father um, was a silversmith, and he um, he because he's Irish, he can't get work. And so he does what a lot of Irish people did. They plied their trade sideways. He became a counterfeiter. And, but he ended up uh, dying in an accident. Um, those, he was working with a lot of chemicals that were very dangerous, and he died when he, uh, Michael was very young. His mom vanishes when he is 11, and he has no idea what has happened to her. He never finds out. He spends a few years thieving, being what's called a star glazer, which meant that he was very good with his knife. So there would be three people, three boys together. Um, one of them would be the lookout uh, or the crow. One of them would be the stargazer, star glazer, that was him. And what he would do is he would go to a plate glass window, pop his knife in along the side, crack it a little bit, which would make a little star, and then you could remove it silently so as not to alarm anyone. And then the third boy would be the one who grabbed everything out of the window and, and took off. And this is how he made his living, and he stayed alive for a few years, but eventually, he, um, one day he is, he's walking along a street and he hears three guys beating up a fourth one and calling him dirty Irish. And before he even really kind of knows what he's doing, he grabs one of them, puts his knife to his throat and says, lay off, okay, back off. And of course he doesn't get away scot-free, he gets kind of beat up himself and everything else. But this boy, Pat Doyle, is like, Okay, you've got a big cut on your forehead. Come home with me. My mom will fix this up. And eventually, he's adopted by this family. And Ma Doyle is one of my favorite characters. Mm -hmm. She is she's solid. She's um, a, you know she is self reliant. She um, her husband died, and so she runs a shop in Whitechapel. She is good with a cup of tea and sympathy for her neighbors. She understands the Cobwaller gang, which is active, but she it maintains decent relationship with them. Um, and she's, she's a great mom. And she was a really good mom to Coravin. And so he starts um, bare knuckles boxing when he is about 17. He's working on the docks with Pat. He and Pat, Pat have these jobs. And, and um, I can say a little bit more about the whole dock thing because that was really interesting. I did some research on that last time I was in London. But the two of them are working on the docks and one day um, a guy named O'Hagan comes to the docks looking for talent. And he sees Michael Corbin who is big and strong, he's got quick hands, and he says, hey, want to come box for me? And he offers him a sum of money that Michael Corbin knows will change the Doyle's lives. So he starts boxing for him. And um, he is doing so well, eventually, that Corvin um, is, is so good that O'Hagan basically says to him one day, okay, you got to throw a match. I'm not making any money on you. Nobody will bet against you. You need to throw a match. And Corvin, you know, he's 18. He's like, I don't want to throw a match. And he's like, O'Hagan, okay, okay. like, you have to. Otherwise, you're out of here. And so Corvin goes into the ring intending to, and he, he can't do it. And so, of course, O'Hagan throws him out on his ear. Um, and, 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 and unfortunately, Corvin makes the mistake of hitting this boy, Tom Devlin, Tom Devlin really, really hard. And um, so O'Hagan throws him out on his ear. And a couple days later, the police show up and bust up the boxing hall. And of course, O'Hagan assumes Corvin, you know, Corvin ran him out which is not actually what happened. But um, anyway, so, so Ma Doyle comes to him on the docks that night um, as just as he's getting off of work, hands him a bag of clothes and food and a little bit of money and says, run, get out of here, O'Hagan's after you. And so he crosses the river and he goes to Lambeth. And that's where he becomes a uniformed constable. That's where he finds a job. And that's, and, and you know, he, he, he Starts out in uniform like everybody does, walking a beat, you know, walking around a perimeter. It, it takes one hour and 15 minutes he has to walk. And eventually he becomes an inspector at Scotland Yard. Um, and when Down and Dark River begins, it's right in the aftermath of that horrible trial. Um, people are still not so keen on Scotland Yard when he gets under a veiled moon. Um, but that's, that's Michael Corvin's backstory. And it came to me in pieces. I read a lot of, um, there's one book that I always read. Um, I kind of go back to it every year. It's by Haya 
Speyer Metcalf. It's called The Rise of the Detective in Victorian and Edwardian England. It's uh, um, heavy and scholarly and historical. And it's, it's really wonderful. It's got tons of primary source information and illustrations and all kinds of stuff. And there are also a lot of vignettes, a lot of stories from police inspectors of the time where they, you know, they, they kept memoirs or they, they wrote letters and, and she has a lot of that information in there. So that's where I could kind of get some of Michael Corbin's story. And then I did a bunch of research on what it is like to be Ireland in 1870s. So that was where I, that's where I came up with him. So I don't need to ask her why she writes historical mystery, right? You can already tell she's a real <laughs> history geek. Um, but what's interesting is that basically the themes and the stuff that's going on is, is amazingly contemporary. Um, it, you know, it really proves that we we really don't learn from our past. We just have different tools um, and so forth. So Lambeth, which Karen mentioned, is the south side of the Thames. It's actually where the um, Lambeth Palace is, where the Archbishop of Canterbury, who could be in Canterbury, but actually is in Lambeth, um, resides. And in the, I know that. Yep. And in the book, um, I've read a lot more medieval mystery than you have. <laughs> um, in, in the book, one of the problems that results from this terrible sinking of the Princess Alice is that some of the bodies drift south and some of the bodies are north and they're not allowed jurisdictionally because they're different. The, the people looking for the family members, looking for people they may have lost, can't, they're not all in one place, you know, and um, Corbin gets into trouble, I think, in part. Do mm -hmm. I remember? Because he brings some of the bodies from the south side across, or how does it work? He he breaks that, that rule somewhere. Um, he actually doesn't, but he pushes Vincent, his uh, Mr. Vincent, who is the head of the yard, really hard to make an exception. And because he, he says, oh, this is just, okay. this is just stupid. Um, and what they ended up doing actually in real life, um, because you know, when, when, the, when, the sh when the ship went down, um, the Bywell Castle had its hand basically on the horn. <laughs> like they were just, they were, they were trying to get people tra attract attention. So all these like tugboats and, and like lighter boats and little fishermen, I mean, they were all, it was kind of like Dunkirk. They were all coming to try to help and get people, you know, into their boats and get them to shore. But some of them rode north, as you said, some of them right. went south. The tide was rolling this way. So a lot of people were going downstream. Yeah, the and, tide and was the, going east. Exactly. While the, yeah, so. And, the, and, the, and there, there are all these marshes and all that marshland and everything yeah. down there. And, um, but what ended up happening in real life is they, they started recovering the drowned bodies and they were so disgusting. But what they started doing, and this is a real, a real thing that they did, was they, for example, if they found a, 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 a corpse, it would be very waterlogged, but they would take the jewelry and some buttons from the clothing and anything that hadn't been destroyed by water and put it in a small box. And then they put it on a table in this big, long building that they had, and people could come and try and reclaim. And they, so they would match that, you know, they put number like 68, and then the, there was a toe tag 68 on the person so that the people didn't have to actually view the bodies. But like, this is a, this is a, I thought this was actually sort of an ingenious mm -hmm. way around it. Um, but it was, yeah, it was, I mean, after two days, the bodies apparently were just repulsive and nobody could go in the buildings. It was so really bad. Yeah, it was the local gas works that yeah. had a giant shed, which yep. they, two of them, yep. made available. There wasn't any such thing as refrigerated morgues um, <laughs> at this point in time. So there we go. Right. Yeah. But, you know, the, the themes that Karen's writing about, you know, the horrors of being being immigrants, um, the prejudice against immigrants, the, you know, lack of um, um, care for children. It's very Dickensian, you know, in the way that children were just left on their own. You know, parents would die or parents would disappear and, you know, kids were left. It's Oliver Twist. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. Um, and it's an, it's an interesting thing about character. Why is it that some of those kids went bad and some of them never did? You know, it really does come down to character. And it's just that that whole nature-nurture debate, mm -hmm. I think, is an interesting one. But Dickens, Dickens himself, had brushes with all of that, which is one reason that I think he was able to write books like yeah. Oliver Twist. The workhouse and everything, yeah. Yeah. And, his, and I mean, his sister, um, Fanny, who was, she was studying at the Royal Academy. She was one of my inspirations for Nell Hallam in Dangerous Duet. Right. She was studying at the Royal Academy. And um, I mean, she was a genius. She was studying with one of Beethoven's prodigies. I mean, that kind of piano player. And she, um, 
ended up, I mean, the Dickens family was notoriously sort of in and out of debt, and she ended up at one point not having money for tuition, and she had to quit. And then she ended up dying what, like 14 years later or something. And it was just yeah. a tragic, horrible story. And I think, I think that that shaped Dickens. Um, you know, I think that he was, he was very aware of how There were many things that terrible. shaped Dickens, was, right? Yeah. He lived down the river in Rotherhithe, which was one of the first places I went to the first time I went to England, and I was defeated by park and dis pay and display. I couldn't figure out the parking. Oh. I mean, you know, they had this this really interesting system called pay and display, and I remember there was the Dickens house, and I thought, I'm not going to get to see it because I can't figure out how to pay for the car, right? But, you know, Dickens himself had a late, a late life affair. He had nine children with his wife, and then basically he set up a mistress and um, an actress mm -hmm. called Ellen Terry. Mm -hmm. And in order to make money, he came over here and toured the United States and, you know, did paid lectures. Mm -hmm. So he had a, in 56 years, I think, he was in his middle 50s when he died. He had a, mm -hmm. and, and one of the reasons he died young was he was in one of those terrible Victorian train accidents. With and he mistress. suffered so, such <laughs> terrible PTSD from it. Because mm -hmm. the train accidents were just as frightful as the one that you're talking about. Partly because of the clothing. Yes. No seatbelts. You know, th all the things that could go wrong. Mm -hmm. So you have a train accident. The reason I bring this up yeah. is that you actually have a train accident before the Princess mm -hmm. Alice goes down in this book. Mm -hmm. So then the question arises, could it be coincidence that there's a train wreck and then the steamship goes down? Yeah. Or not? And it was a real train wreck, too much to my surprise. And, and this is like the crazy thing. Like sometimes you feel like the universe is telling you you have to write a book. But it's... Um, I when I found out about the Princess Alice disaster, I the you know, Down the Dark River was already, you know, really mostly done and, and, and well on its way. And I thought, oh, well maybe I could move it in time to make it happen after the down after Down a Dark River. Well Down a Dark River ends in July of eighteen seventy eight and the Princess Alice is in September of eighteen seventy eight. And I thought I don't even have to move anything. And then when I was researching like more stuff that was happening around the time of the disaster, it turned out there were a series of terrible things. One of them was this railway crash that was in Kent, I think it was, um, not very far from Staplehurst, which is where Dickens had his railway crash. And, um, and then there was also a, a terrible coal mining accident. I mean, it, it was not safe to be Victorian. <laughs> They just had a terrible number of, of you know, because they industrialized so fast they and did. nobody thought anything about no. it. Maybe mercury, mercury was in retrograde when all this was going on. Yeah, it's hard to say, but I mean, you know, even, I mean, you know, it takes a long time for an industrial society to actually involve safety measures. I remember being in China in 1997 and being taken to a, a rug factory, so to speak. And they said, quite matter-of-factly, that most of the women who worked there had to leave in their late 30s because by then they'd gone blind from the closeness of the work and the lack of light and so forth. And it was like, well, you know, there's plenty more. So, uh, And there was like no retirement plan. Or, I mean, I really can understand why labor unions, you know, mm -hmm. arose to try to combat a lot of it. It's interesting right now. There's a big, you know, labor unions. Who knew that Starbucks would be, you know, they even pay tuition to go to college, and yet their working conditions are such that um, Starbucks is unionized. There are bookstores in New York that have unionized. If this bookstore unionizes, it's over. I'm done <laughs> right now. But I am a benevolent employer, so it's not going to happen. But still, I mean, you know, surprising places that people would feel that one of the hot spots for Starbucks was right down here in Tempe, wasn't it? Tempe or Mesa hmm. was one of the, yeah, the yeah. yeah oppressive working conditions, which is hard to imagine in Starbucks, but still, maybe if you're working the drive-in window and the regular counter, you know, it, people get abusive, I don't yeah, know. But my point is that, you know, Karen's writing about, you know, a century and a half ago, but nonetheless, it's very contemporary. If you, you know, look at the at the issues, the, the human issues and the societal issues, really haven't changed that much. Yeah. Well, and the other, you know, you know, you bring up the, the, the connection between present day and 1870s. And another thing was that um, the whole question of social media and how it is not just, you know, obviously news is not just news anymore. It is not just rep attempting to represent what happens. It shapes 
our perception of it. And it's and very self-consciously so. Um, but in Victorian England, you had 1,000 newspapers, largely unregulated, like the railway industry and everything else. Yep. Um, so you have 1,000 newspapers who are you know, shading the truth this way or that way or putting this kind of illustration in or putting two things next to each other to suggest a connection that isn't just sort of like, oh, we happen to put two things next to each other. We want you to read these together and draw your own conclusions right. kinds of thing. I mean, they were doing things like this. And so um, that was one of the other things I wanted to explore in this book was the way that um, newspapers can shape our perception and actually have very material effects afterwards. You bet. But we have a, a newly literate population. Our yeah. Newspapers didn't have a lot of traction in Elizabethan England. Um, but, you know, by the time we get here, there's, mm -hmm. um, yeah. I'm trying to remember, I think there's compulsory school yeah. or to like age 12 or something. Mm -hmm. You can still leave school in Britain at 14 or 16, which is, it's very low. Yeah. Very it, young it age. Um, but yeah, surprisingly small people go to college. I remember walking through Brighton years ago and looking at all these kids and they were like 18 and they were, and I thought to myself, life isn't going to get better for them. I mean, this is as good as it's going to be for most of these kids because there's no more education, I mean, no more real jobs. Drifting and looking for work. Or no, they were really working, you know, in a yeah. fish and chips thing or right. this or that and partying hard on the weekends yeah. and all. But, you know, it was like they were at their peak mm -hmm. at, at that age. Um, it's a... It's a very different outlook yeah. on, on education. We tend to think of it's all Oxford and Cambridge, but believe me, it's not all Oxford yeah. and Cambridge by yeah. far. Yeah. So how about questions? That's probably, oh wait, one more. Are you writing another book? I am, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I, I've i really just started it. I had kind of stalled out for about six or eight weeks where I, 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 I kind of had an idea. I was like, I don't like that idea. And it was one of those where I'm, fumbling around trying to figure out get my hands around the the character and the story and that kind of thing of course i wanted to stay with inspector corvin and so um funny story my daughter was actually at oxford for a semester um and in december i i went over um uh, to to help her move out of her dorm because there were language issues <laughs> anyway <laughs> Anyway, so I go over for like two weeks and we had a blast together. And one of the things we did was we went to the Great Scotland Yard Hotel. Now, Scotland Yard, as some of you may know, um, is actually um, the name given in Victorian England to this big cobbled yard that was behind Four Whitehall Place. Four Whitehall Place was the technical address for the Scotland Yard division. Um, but this huge cobbled yard behind it was where everybody sort of gathered, came in and out for the day, that kind of thing. And of course, now that would be worth a zillion dollars in real estate. So someone came in. It's not a. It's not a just an open yard anymore. It is actually a hotel called the Great Scotland Yard Hotel. And have, have you been there mm -hmm. yet? Okay. So next time you're there, go in. It has all kinds of memorabilia from London, um, from Scotland Yard, from like the 1860s, 70s, 80s, and 90s in there. And so they have, um, you know, uh, truncheons and and pictures of uh, you know mug shots and like all this really great ephemera. And one of the other things they have is a bar. And the bar is called 40 Elephants. And when I walked in and I saw the whole Victorian feel of the place, I assumed that 40 Elephants would be because of, um, you know, British Empire, uh, you know, the, their, their invasions into, into India or Africa. Not the case. It actually has to do with 40 Elephants was an all women thieving gang that yeah, originated in, yeah. actually that originated at Elephant and Castle. Oh, that's right. So yeah. Elfin Castle's on the south side of the Thames, and it was known for, um, if you were the unwary traveler who had a couple drinks and sat in front of the nice warm fire that they had at the Elephant and Castle Inn, the next morning you'd wake up, you'd have nothing in your pockets, and all your stuff would be gone. You might even have been, like, weaseled out of your jacket. <laughs> so no kidding. So, um, but this was mostly the men. The Most of the time the men were doing that kind of thieving, but... Um, there eventually the ladies wanted in on it and so their sisters and the moms and the girlfriends they became known as the 40 elephants they were women who specialized in shoplifting and pilfering <laughs> and what they would they had specialized clothing they had very large pockets in their skirts they, some of them would have special dresses sewn where the arms were stuffed into a little ermine muff, and then their hands could be doing this. 
Um, so it, I, I became fascinated by these by these women, plus the fact that they were very beautiful. So they kind of started in the 1870s and 80s. Um, there were actually department stores in London, like Harvey Nichols and stuff, that were were originally drapers shops, and then they became you know then they would add millinery and haberdashery and jewelry and clocks and so on. So that's kind of the origin of the department store in London. But these women would go in, and it was 100 pounds um, a month at least that were getting lost um, from what they were doing. And, um, and I, there's a new book out now actually called 40, The 40 Elephants, and I think it's set in the 1920s. So it's much, much later, um, and I think a little bit more glamorous and everything. But these, this, was, this is kind of the nitty gritty, but I'm fascinated by these women. And I started reading about their stories. There's one woman called Alice Diamond. And I, anyway, so they are going to be a, sort of at the core of my next book, and they are going to be formidable um, adversaries for Corbin. So, uh, yeah. I looked up Jack the Ripper, it's 1888. 1888. So we've got a 10-year gap here before Whitechapel becomes a really yeah. dangerous place. Mm -hmm. Right, so yeah. have you been to the London Police Museum, which is different than the Scotland Yard one? I have not. Well, I have, and the only time I have ever been robbed in London. <laughs> I, was, I exited the London Police Museum, and they had a gang who would be, that was when you, know, you could come across the channel easily an East European gang, and what they would do is they would take knives and cut the bottom out of your purse. So um, oh so that's gosh. what happened to me. And when I went into the friendly local police station, you know, they mm -hmm. looked sort of, you know, like, oh no, another one. But they, <laughs> but they said, you know, that that was what was happening, that this was uh, basically a, gy a gypsy gang that had come in through the channel, um, when England, and possibly one of the reasons the EU connection wasn't Mm -hmm. All that the Britain really wanted it yeah. to be, but I thought it was so ironic. There I was right, in the police I'm museum, in the theater, right? Yeah. So American Express really will come to your rescue. <laughs> if you are, I mean, you just have to call them, and they will show up with a credit card and all the rest of it when this sort of thing happens to you. I do, I do recommend them if you travel because they they really do take care of people, mm -hmm. right? So it's uh, so it'll be a Michael Corbin. Um I'm hoping uh, for Crooked Lane has not. Um, Said whether they're going to give me a third book deal or not, so we're crossing fingers and hoping. Well, we have other choices, so yeah. we'll talk. Yeah. Right. So, <laughs> how about questions? Yeah, questions. Anybody? You're all stunned, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know, that's a, it, that is a really great question because I have a friend who um, is, bit, oh, I'm sorry, I'll repeat it. Um, it the question is about book covers and um, the blurb on the inside, but also the cover design and how much input I have. Um, I have a friend who, um, I think it was, she, I mean, she had, she had published several books and um, she was working, it, I think it depends a lot on the publisher because her publisher basically presented her with a cover and said, you like it, right? <laughs> and she said, I could say yes, or I could say sure. <laughs> Those are my two options. Um, I had a lot more, um, there was a lot more kind of give and take, honestly, with, with, um, with actually with both Harper Collins, who did my first couple books, and then, and with Crooked Lane. Um, I, they ask for, um, you know, just sort of a one to two page synopsis of the book. And then they say, do you have any images? And I always have images around me when I'm working. They, you know, I kind of stick them up on my wall, so I kind of feel like I'm I'm drawing on them a little bit. And so I, you know, I just take those images and I sent them off. And a lot of these were pictures of the Thames, um, pictures of the Princess Alice, the the actual boat, and um, you know, and they knew what Corbin looked like. Um, and so they they could kind of put it together. And I was really lucky that the the artist working on this, she's done both of my covers, and I think she's kind of. I think she she gets the book, um, so because it looks it looks historical, but it's it doesn't. Um, I think it also has a certain amount of energy about it. Um, and then as far as the blurb and this inside that again is collaborative. They write something, and then I um, amend it. One of the 
you know, sometimes they'll they'll put things in that aren't quite accurate. So I have to kind of go back in and, and do some revision. But um, but it, it it's nice. It's 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 a conversation more than it is like you know we're showing it to you and you can say yes you like it or sure I like it. So I'm lucky. Yeah. You are lucky because yeah. it doesn't always go I that know. way, right? No. And you mentioned uh, Charles Dickens' home. Mm -hmm. It was actually Gads Hill School in Shaw. So my son went to school there. Actually, it was his first school. Really? Yeah. Oh wow. From my house, and just looked it up, and he was mm -hmm. there to his death. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if it's a different name. Well, he had a he had a home in Rotherhithe where his children and his wife lived. Um, and it's called the Dickens House. I mean, I've been to it a couple of times. Yeah, that's strange. Yeah, and then Ellen Terry, I mean, you can visit. She had some yeah. kind of a cottage or something mm -hmm. somewhere or other. Gads Hill, um, it may be, the, I, I'm not sure if it's the name of the house in Rutherford. Wikipedia. Uh, the country home of Charles Dickens. Well, a country home wasn't necessarily, you know. Yeah. 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 Right. One of his homes. Yeah. So he lived there for, um, from '56 to his death in 1870. Yeah. He died just just as a funny, That's weird what he little fact. Expectations. Right, mm -hmm. but I think he left his wife and his nine children to live in the house while he went off to live with Ellen Terry. Yeah. So that would, yeah. <laughs> that I would know. sort of explain what happened. Yeah. And she had a sister. I mean, it's very complicated. She had a sister that lived with her and tried to help her deal with, you know, all these all these kids and so forth. So it was. Uh, it was a complicated family. He was a very complicated man. And often, often authors are complicated. They're creative, just like artists and so forth. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you're relatively straightforward. <laughs> You'll have to go through all that. But I have met over the course of 33 years doing this quite a few complicated authors. And it's amazing yeah. how messy some of their personal lives can become. Yeah, I try and keep the mess on the pages. No. <laughs> sure enough. Anyone else have a question? So you were talking about the poor me eloquence of women. Mm -hmm. You seem really excited about them. And you love Maud Doyle from the first book. Mm -hmm. So in this book, who would be, is Maud Doyle in there? Or who's the character that you're just like really connecting in and love with? In, the, in this next, in this third book that I'm imagining? No, in this oh, one. In, in, oh, in this book, yeah. The, the 40 elephants is for the, the, the third one. Um, the character I'm connecting, I mean, obviously, I mean, I'm, I'm always, you know, sort of my heart goes out to Michael Corbin, but he's got, um, there's, so the Doyle family is Ma Doyle, um, and then there, were, there was a, a, another son who died, and, um, and then there's Patrick, and he died. And so they're all, the only two children remaining now, besides you know um, Corbin, who's adopted, are Colin and Elsie. They're a pair of twins. They're 19 years old. And Elsie is one of my favorite characters. She is um, straight talking. She is she's got a lot of her mom's um, empathy and compassion, but she's also very practical. And you know she's grown up in Whitechapel her whole life. She you know knows how to handle herself, that kind of thing. But Colin is. Uh, got, he's gotten mixed up with Cowboller Gang, the Irish Cowboller Gang, and he is in trouble. But Michael Corvin, he is not letting Michael Corvin help get him out of it. And Corvin doesn't understand why. And that's part of that's part of his personal journey in the book. But Colin is one of the like he he just kind of tugs at my heart because he's kind of a mess. He's a good kid at heart, but he's making some really bad decisions. So, yeah. You haven't mentioned that Michael Corvin has acquired a lady oh, companion yes. who I really like. Belinda liked. Gale. Belinda. Yeah. Belinda's great. Yeah. 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 Belinda and, and Belinda, you know, when I when I first started writing Belinda, she's a kind of a composite of four Victorian women authors that some of whom I wrote about in my dissertation. So I knew them. And uh, like Mary Braddon, yeah. um, uh, um I, th I think Mary Elizabeth Bradley was really kind of like one of the key ones, but there's there's um, George. Um, Isn't Mary Elizabeth Bradley an author? George Eliot, thank you. Oh yeah, she okay, yeah. she is an author, yeah, right? In Mary fact, Elizabeth she wrote Braden, yeah. novels of sensation, mm -hmm. if she I remember did sensation right. Sensation novels, um, and Mrs. Henry Wood, who wrote East Lynne, which was the number one best-selling Victorian novel of all time ever. She's like the Daniel Steele of the day. 
Um, and so more like Colleen Hoover or Colleen Hoover. Yes. And, and so, you know, so Belinda, you know, kind of came into being because of that, but you know, as she and Michael Corvin evolved together. So the way that he meets her is, um, she is, she holds weekly soirees at her house and someone has thrown a brick through her window and jumped in through her library and ransacked the whole entire place. And they find out that it was basically a protest because she had had someone um, at her soiree who was advocating birth control. Now, this is a real true thing that happened. So I was kind of fascinated by that. Um, but anyway, so so he's called to the crime scene, right? And, you know, because mm -hmm. this is, you know, I mean, everything's been trashed and, you know, hundreds of pounds worth of damage to her books and her library and her carpets and everything else. So he, he's the detective who comes in. And that's how they meet. And she promised her father on his deathbed that she would not marry in haste. And so she and Corbin have been together for a while, but she has not married him. And she won't marry him, not for a while yet. So, but she is the EQ to his street smarts. She's insightful. She sometimes, she is not reluctant to tell him when he is going astray and going off in the wrong direction. She'll, she'll pull him back in and say, you know, you're not, you're not looking at this right. You know, you're not taking this person's feelings into account or this person's motives or whatever. And so she's kind of the, she's kind of the balance, kind of like Charlotte works for, for, um, Pitt, for, Pitt, for yeah. Thomas. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 I like her a lot. Yeah. Anyone else? Yes. Who has any of the characters come to you? Um, you know, you mentioned the images you have, and of course, mm -hmm. you have the numbers now, mm -hmm. which are pretty immersed in it. But I'm just curious is there a certain time for day or night or dream? Is there a day and time? And this might be a really, you know, beginner's question, but I'm just very curious for you if. You know, these characters are so rich in the living. Yes. Yes. Um, the question is about character development and whether I have a particular way of developing them night or day. How do I do it? And um, I think when I first started writing, when I was writing Lady in the Smoke, I mean, years ago now, um, that book took me so long to write and, and revise, um, I used to feel very, like I had to be very rigid. Like I had to say, you know, I will write from 9 to 11 every day, or I will write this number of words, or that kind of thing. And over time, I think you begin to get to the point where you really trust yourself and you, you know, you know you're going to settle down to write at some point during the day. It doesn't need to be at a particular time, but you know you have to, you know, Part, you know, take everything off your plate and just sit with it. And when I'm developing characters, one of the my, the key things that I do, and the, the most important thing I've come around to doing, is writing um, longhand, for whatever reason it's easier longhand, I feel more connected to them, um, their own story in their own voice and from the first person. So for example, when I was writing Down a Dark River, um, and I was coming up with a character of Styles, I have a sheet, and I still have it scribbled on legal pad it says my name is gordon styles i'm 21 years old i grew up outside of london i have three sisters and i i write the events of the book and a good chunk of his backstory from his perspective sometimes four or five pages so that they're in my head so that when i put him and corvin in a room together i know how they're going to talk to each other i know what they're going to say i know what styles's concerns are going to be for example but that's that's how I, but it has to be, a, I can't just write down like he's left-handed, he has blonde hair, like th th that does nothing for me. Like it leaves me feeling very empty inside. Yeah, I just don't feel that. But if I'm telling his story and talking about how his sister, he watched his sister um, when her best friend got run over by a cart and that's why he knows, and, and, and she went silent for weeks and that's why he understands what trauma can do to somebody that that gives me something to hang on to. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. Are you keeping all of that? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah. The reason I ask that is that I can't tell you how many authors um, don't actually keep track of all that and um, are then later in their series 
can't either make mistakes because they don't remember it or they have to go back oh. and reread the earlier books. I had a conversation with John Connolly about that uh -huh. the other night, you know, and many of them wish they'd kept what, what is essentially kind of a series Bible or diary. Mm -hmm. But Karen, if you're listening to that, you know, yeah. she just saves all those sheets, you know, <laughs> she'll save herself some grief if she writes a long, a long series. Oh, it's not so bad if it's just one book or two, but if you're yeah, on book 12 or something. You need, you need those, you need those, uh, that, uh, right. you just see my office is such a mess. Like it's, it's really bad. I mean, I try, I try to put things in stacks, but I have stacks on right. the floor and it's, it's really, it's really bad. It gets a fire, I talk about fire hazard, it's a fire hazard. Um, but I do, right. I do think that, you know, having all that stuff is, is, is helpful and, you know, and, and, you know, and I add to it too, you know, I mean, Right. The story gets a little bit more complicated and, and that kind of thing. And frankly, my memory is not what it used to be, and I need it <laughs> to help me. Otherwise, at some point, Styles is going to grow from, you know, five foot ten to six foot four and change the color of his eyes. And <laughs> exactly, which can happen. We have time for one more question, then we probably need to move towards actually yeah. signing books. Anybody else? In my fondest dreams, I see this on, on screen. I mean, so much of the writing I do, oftentimes I, it's like watching a movie and I'm just writing down what happens. Like I, I can see it happening and I'm just scribbling because I, but um, the person that I've always kind of imagined is a young Hugh Jackman. I mean, good choice. Yeah, do you, do you approve? Yeah. But you're um, not going to realize. But... <laughs> That's a great idea. Amy, I left whatever the book was I was going to give away on the counter behind you. Um, I can't remember what it looks like. Um, and I need to know how many tickets they are. Because one of the things, reason we give you a numbered ticket A is to control the signing line so we don't all behave like third graders. But the other, <laughs> I can't tell you some of the scrum that has evolved over. Um, oh, you're going to let me pick it. Okay. Yeah, I. Um, it was my stack over there on the on the. Um, it doesn't, doesn't look like any of those. I think that might have been something. It was right up against the wall. Well, while Amy's looking for, oh, there it is. Pat's found them. Thank you. Uh, how many numbers are we dealing with, guys? Okay. So let me find the book, and then Karen, Karen will pick. Thank you so much. I'm sorry I forgot. Um, there, in fact, is... This, by the way, is what's known as an advanced reading copy. This is the paper-bound version of a fairly rough draft that I got months ago. So I could read it and write about it and come down here and talk to you about it and so forth. But at least it has the right cover. Oftentimes, I am hugely surprised when I come here and I see the real book and I think, what's that? It doesn't look like it. Yep. The book I'm going to give away is by Stacy Willingham, and it's called All Dangerous Things. And we'll be seeing Stacy in January. She had a, an excellent first novel called A Flicker in the Dark last year. And this one is about Isabel Drake leaving her living her every mother's worst nightmare. Her toddler son is taken from his crib in the middle of the night and disappears. And how is she going to? ever recover him or find him. She's a very interesting author. So if you'll pick a number between 1 and 35, we will give this book away. And you have to be here to win. So if if one of the numbers is not shown up, we'll move okay. on to another number. All right. It's uh, my, my lucky number is 8. That's you? Oh, awesome. There's a real person here who's going to win it. I'm going, I don't get up. I'll, I'll find you. You're not. Okay. So let's thank Karen for a wonderful afternoon. So I'm going to ask you, and I know there's so many of you, it's a little complicated. We are going to line up by number, but to do that, we really ought to move these chairs. If you could lean them against that wall, this wall, the bookshelves curve and, and the, the chairs. Before you do that, can I just say thank you? Oh, sure. Thank you so much for coming. I, I, writing, it's like, writing can be a very solitary thing, and, and this yeah. is what makes it feel like it's not solitary. You're kind of all with me as I'm creating. So thank you. We certainly thank you for coming. Don't forget to sign up for the newsletter either, which is up on the counter. You need to unpick yourself before you walk off. Yes, and I can see dropping it on. Uh... Oh, okay. We'll put my book in December. Okay. okay.